Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is truly an honor to have you uh, with us this evening and to have with us six statesmen who were instrumental in crafting the historic diplomatic process that led to the unification of Germany in 1990. Their vision and their leadership proved essential to bringing the Cold War to its peaceful conclusion. We are also delighted to have with us in the audience Dr. Klaus Schariot, the Ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany to the United States. Welcome. On the video screen is a photograph of the foreign ministers of the United States, the United Kingdom, the Soviet Union, France, and West and East Germany on June 22nd, 1990, who were at a meeting in Berlin on the occasion of the removal of Checkpoint Charlie which separated the Soviet and American sectors of Berlin during the Cold War. Our discussion this evening will be moderated by the well-known historian Dr. Douglas Brinkley, our Baker Institute Fellow in History and Rice University Professor of History. Doug will introduce our distinguished speakers in one moment. Before we begin, allow me to add that two of our speakers will be delivering their remarks in their native languages we have provided headsets for the foreign language translation, which is at your seats. There is an instruction card in each one of your chairs. If you have any trouble adjusting your headset, please raise your hand and one of our Baker Institute staff will help you. Questions from the audience will be taken during the course of the program. After filling out your question card, please pass it to the end of the aisle and a staff member will collect your question uh, card during the discussion uh, period. As much as pe possible, I would urge you to direct your questions on your card to a specific speaker. Now, without further delay, it's my pleasure to turn the podium over to Dr. Brinkley. Doug? Thank you. Well, thank you for coming here to Rice University to the Baker Institute for this very historic occasion. We have a a, an incredibly important panel of people to reflect on what happened uh, on German reunification. And I'm going to briefly introduce them and we will get on to the um, questions. At the end, we'll be having a, some questions coming from the audience of the session. Uh, first, the Honorable James A. Baker III, Secretary of State of the United States from 1989 to 1992. Next to him is the Honorable Roland Dumas, Foreign Minister of the French Republic, 1984 to 1986. And then again, from 1988 to 1993, Your Excellency, welcome to Houston. Um, next to him, fixing the earpiece right now, is the Honorable Hans Dietrich Genscher, Foreign Minister of the Federal Republic of Germany from 1974 to 1992. Your Excellency, welcome. Um, there is the Right Honorable Charles Pohl, the Private Secretary of Prime Ministers Margaret Thatcher and John Major of the United Kingdom from 1983 to 1991. And the Honorable Marcus Meckel, Minister of Foreign Affairs, German Democratic Republic, 1990. Minister Meckel, welcome. The I wanted to begin by asking um, each of the gentlemen a, a, a question about what they see as being the historical significance of German reunification. And I'll start with Secretary Baker. Okay, Doug, thank you very much. <clears throat> Let me begin by thanking the other panelists for coming all this distance to be with us tonight. They, they've come a, a long, long way. And in fact, I think Hans Dietrich Genscher just arrived from Germany and came straight to the Institute. So we're very, very appreciative of their willingness to make these long journeys. I'm particularly pleased also that Charles Pohl is with us. Uh, he came on very short notice when Douglas Hurd became indisposed. Uh, I think it's probably very easy uh, to think uh, that German unification was somehow inevitable. Uh, and you could argue, I suppose, that at one level it was. Once the Berlin Wall fell, 
there was significant momentum towards some, por some kind of German unification, and the idea became pretty much irresistible. But the ultimate shape and form of that unification in both its domestic and its international aspects was far from clear and far from inevitable. Uh, after November 9 and the fall of the wall, there were a lot of questions uh, out there that we had to face. First of all, if you unified Germany, what precise form would it take? Would it be a confederation? Would it be a merger of the German Democratic Republic into the existing constitutional structure of the Federal Republic? What would a unified Germany's relationship be to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization? What would it be to the European Union? How would German unification affect the then ongoing efforts to reduce residual Cold War tensions between the East and the West? And we finally uh, and eventually answered those questions, but I think all of my colleagues here would agree that it took some very hard work. There's a lot of credit, I think, to go around for uh, the achievement of German unification, first and foremost, and I was telling this to Marcus Meckel in my office a f few minutes ago, I, f I think it must go first and foremost to the indomitable spirit of the people of the German Democratic Republic. Just like freedom uh, for other countries in Central and Eastern Europe must go a lot of the credit to the people of those countries. But the people of East Germany never lost their longing for freedom. And in a sense, they took history into their own hands on November 9, 1989. But others were due great credit as well, in my view, and those others were our bosses. First of all, President Bush 41, Chancellor Kohl of the Federal Republic of Germany, Prime Minister Thatcher, and President Mitterrand. Their statesmanship, I think, was decisive in the dramatic months that followed that fall of the wall. And of course, we will never forget, none of us, nor will history, forget the critical roles played by Soviet leaders Mikhail Gorbachev and Eduard Shevardnadze because it was their very brave and courageous decision not to use force to keep the Soviet Empire together that made all of this possible. I think really we can all be reasonably proud of our efforts. History presented us with a very, very narrow window of opportunity I think we took advantage of it, working together, all of us, uh, and our governments and our leaders were able to shape events in ways that peacefully reunited Germany, that bolstered regional security at the time, that supported the ongoing economic and political integration of Europe, and that contributed to a peaceful end of the Cold War. Now, where perhaps we did not do a perfect job, ladies and gentlemen, but I hope my colleagues will agree with me that we did a damn good one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Minister Dumas, would you like to make a few minutes of... Yes. Je vais parler en français. Mesdames et messieurs, je suis très heureux de me trouver là pour la deuxième fois. I will speak in French. I'm very glad to be here. And it's the first time that we will be talking about this subject. The historians that will later study this period will certainly confirm that the regime before the war was the world was divided and obviously people created at the same time they created a situation that could not satisfy the Germans who legitimately or from the very beginning claim for the reunification. We have assisted a very slow but progressive growth in the situation in East Germany. The ambassadors, the relationships witnessed the, dif the difficulties economically from East 
Germany. And we clearly knew that with this situation, it could not hold on for a long time. So what I did in Berlin, and I, I said, at the end of the century, we will see the end of the communist regime in Germany and in Europe as a whole. It was a provision at the time a little bit uh, insolent, but we didn't know at the time that this would end or how it would end. And today, I think it's quite funny that everybody say, well, we had predicted the fall of the Berlin Wall. We predicted the reunification. Of course, it's all very nice after all these years. But when the wall fell, we do have to reestablish the chronology of what happened. The key factor after many meetings and uh, the people of Germany with the different demonstrations and protests in November 9. Obviously, these were peaceful protests, but they were important. And November 9 was needed with the East German government decision, they made the decision to liberate the borders, to inform that even though the East Germans can go freely to West Germany, this was clearly for two or three million Germans came and they quickly came back. And there was a, it was like a wave going back and forth. But if you will, the, the goal, but what happened was really not what we expected. Actually, it took a very long time, almost two years for this first action that generated the reunification had to become a reality with all the agreements. And I will remind you that obviously 20 days after the fall of the wall, what happened is that the Chancellor Kohl made his speech talking about the Confederation of Gen Germany with 10 points that uh, were orders and facilities to try to achieve this unification process. But 10 days later, the fall, 10 days after the fall of the wall, we didn't have the conscience of what was going to happen. And actually, we, had, we did need to resolve several problems that we will talk about in a few minutes. But we knew, we knew it. But we all of a sudden realized that if Germany had lost the war, there was never a peace treaty. And the situation, the international situation of Germany, was left within the context of a sharing of this state. So with the original negotiation of the two by four, two plus four, the two Germanys, I, with the invitation of the four allies to talk about how we were going to reunify Germany. So after a few days, we needed six negotiation sessions. The last one was in Moscow with Gorbachev with the signature of a treaty that helped in a sui generis way to be a peace treaty that we really didn't have. So the fall of the wall that obsesses us today and that became a huge event as time went by, the comments, the images were not other than something that was going to happen within two years. And I'm finishing with this. The true conclusion of the Berlin Wall happened two years later, when East Germany, I turned to my colleague, two years later, stopped existing. At that moment is where East Germany became the Germany of today. And so we needed two good years before the Berlin Wall fell from after, of course, the 2 plus 4 situation, determine the international situation in Germany. 
so that these two years go by and the negotiations happen. So it's, it wasn't just one event, it was a series of events. Thank you very much. <laughs> Minister Genscher. Yep. For me, on the 9th of November 89, the dream became reality. Uh, this is not uh, a surprise to you. I'm born in the east of Germany. I left GDR at the age of 25 in 52. And now this wonderful event, the wall is open. Was this just a German affair? Many people in Germany thought so, and some people in Europe also. It was not only a German affair, it was a European affair. More or less it was a world affair because it was the end, beginning of the end of the Cold War. I uh, was on the 9th of uh, November with Chancellor Kohl for an official visit in uh, uh, Warsaw. During the official dinner we received the message, the wall is open, it became a very short dinner and we decided to return next day. But in the morning before we left, I had a meeting with Lech Walesa and with his uh, uh, advisor in foreign relations, Bronislaw Geremek, who later became foreign minister of the democratic Poland. And Geremek said, the fall of the wall, that means German unification. It is a great day for the Germans, but at the same day, it's a great day for Poland. Because when Germany is united, Poland is neighbor of uh, the NATO, is neighbor of the European community. Today, they are member of NATO. They are member of the European community. It shows how closely connected the fate of the nations in Europe are, and in particular where, in this year 89. In, in the past, we, we are, could witness revolutions and demonstrations. The first time on, on the 7th of June 1953 in GDR. Uh, the, the Soviet tanks left the barracks and stopped the demonstrations. The same in 56 in Hungary, 68 in Czechoslovakia, then Solidarność in Poland. But 89, it was a very new situation because not only in Poland or in Czechoslovakia or in Hungary or in all over Europe, what we could witness in 89 was a real European freedom revolution. And the people in the streets did it. They have the merit of overcoming the division of Europe. When in the, on the 9th of October there was a demonstration of 70,000 people in the city of Leipzig. And they had one word. We, we are the people. We, not you, above, we are the people. We are one nation and no use of wars. This was a peaceful revolution what started. What we could do in the West was to prepare a stable framework in which developments like this peaceful revolution could proceed without any danger for stability in Europe. There were many people deeply concerned about German unification, they saw a problem for European stability. I think NATO was by far more wise in its assessment when we uh, agreed on the so-called Hamel report in 1967. There was that the main obstacle for stability in Europe is the division of Germany. This was real assessment to overcome this division meant we will gain stability and we did so we can say we are very grateful for all who cooperated with us supporting our idea we have to pay gratitude to the people in moscow who had changed the position substantially the position of the soviet union 
by more or less revolution from above. And for them, the size, if I say this, in this very room, for, for the Soviet leadership, in the two plus four negotiations and in our bilateral talks, was decisive what is the position of uh, the United States of America. And we as Germans owe great gratitude to President Bush and Secretary Baker for their unhesitating and strong and clear support for our unification. And we owe gratitude to our French and British friends, British friends, uh, 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 uncertain for, for, uh, for their support given to our unification, but the expert for, of, to explain the position of uh, uh, Mrs. Thatcher is uh, sitting here on my side. So thank you very much. I say it here in this very city. Thank you very much, United States, for your help in this decisive phase of our history. <laughs> Lord Paul. Well, I will happily talk about Margaret Thatcher's views of German reunification, perhaps somewhat later in the discussion. But let me just say at the beginning that I think the 1980s were the most remarkable decade of post-war history. I think the years immediately after World War II with a great creative surge when we came up with the United Nations and NATO and the Bretton Woods Institution, that was a great period. And the other great period was the 1980s. In the United States, President Reagan rebuilt the country's confidence and the economy and stood up to Soviet communism, wasn't going to be defeated by it, instead wanted to bring it down. Uh, he had strong support from Margaret Thatcher, who at the same time was completely changing Britain from top to toe. And great things were happening in Europe too, in Germany and in France. Great changes were taking place. And in a way, I think the fall of the wall and German reunification at the end of the decade were a fitting end to it, because they really drew a line under the post-war period. In 1989 and 90, we essentially achieved what we had wanted since 1945, which was a Europe that was peaceful and united, with at the heart of it a Germany which was peaceful and united. And it took 45 years and some very remarkable people amongst Western statesmen, a very remarkable man in President Gorbachev, but above all, the courage of the people in Hungary, in Czechoslovakia, in Poland, and above all in Eastern Germany, because they were the ones who, in the end, did it. I think Western governments created the conditions in which it could happen. But at the end of the day, it would not have happened without the individual decisions, the individual bravery of people who were prepared to go on the street and fight for what they knew they wanted and was their right. So it, for me, it's a huge historic occasion, one which really made everything we had done during the Cold War worthwhile. I'll stop at that point. Minister Meckel. Thank you. I think uh, it is interesting to hear and to listen to that different views. Uh, my past was growing up in the communist country, in the eastern part of Germany. And so uh, because I grew up in the house of a Protestant pastor, um, I was in a distant to that society from the beginning. It was an experience of my childhood. And um, my father was coming from the western part uh, of Germany and went to the eastern part back after uh, being imprisoned in a Russian camp after the Second World War. And so that question of belonging together on the one hand, uh, the responsibility of the Second World War, uh, which was an important point for us as Germans. Uh, and then to have that a communist experience, that was a framework from my childhood. And um, then belonging to the opposition, uh, which had much to do with church, not only, but uh, it was important that we had an independent church in East Germany. And we had that experience that if you 
could see any change in the eastern part of uh, Europe, uh, the Russian tanks came. They came in 53 uh, to East Germany, they came in 56 to Hungary, they came in 68 to Czechoslovakia. And that was a framework of our life. And only in the second part of the 80s, there was some hope with Gorbachev that exactly this could change. And that's why, at first, I would like to mention that we are very uh, have a gratitude to Mr. Gorbachev that he gave that perspective, not only for us in East Germany, but also for Poland and Hungary, which at first started to change the domestic situation, um, Hungary going uh, west with very silent steps. Um, you, we know the changes with solidarity um, in the 80s. And this gave us hope that we can start again. And so in the end of the 80s, we in the opposition looked for new organization, new structures of opposition. I myself, together with a friend, uh, we decided in January uh, 89 to uh, create the Social Democratic Party in East uh, Germany, which meant in that time that we um, read really the roots of the Communist Party, which called themselves a united one, socialists, social democrats and communists to be united. Um, and we made clear this is really a communist party in a dictatorship when we started with the Social Democratic Party. And so, you know the events during uh, 89, we looked to Poland with a round table, the first half free election. We looked to Hungary. I myself visited Hungary and Romania at that time, uh, in summer of uh, 89, and had that experience, which was what was possible there in this country, and I came back, I, in difference, uh, with a really high account of many uh, people of East Germany who only wanted to leave the country. I came back together with friends to create an opposition and to the change of that communist country. And we were very happy, it was mentioned by Hans Dietrich Genscher, the 9th of October, that was a breakthrough with 70,000 people in Leipzig. I experienced it with 10,000 in Magdeburg. That was a breakthrough and we were sure from that day, two days before, we created formally the Social Democratic Party in East Germany. And from the 9th of October, we were sure we will succeed with democracy. And it was clear that two democratic German states, that would be crazy with a wall. But that, in that time, was a question of after. At first, to create democracy, and then the question of unity in the framework of Europe and with the acceptance of Europe. This was very important. And so, I think uh, that 9th of November was the effect, as it was mentioned, the effect of the victory of freedom and democracy in the eastern part, of especially of the Central European part of Europe, uh, the fall of the wall was the effect of that peaceful revolution in Central Europe, and the Eastern German revolution is a part of that. And what we had to do in 1990 then, that was only to manage the effects, to manage the effects because the victory of freedom gave us the opportunity for unity, the unity of Germany, and the unification of Europe. And this is a heart that from that Europe could be united. And this, I think, is a challenge for us today. Thank you. In front of the Baker Institute, we have a piece of the Berlin Wall. And uh, a lot of students go by and people who come here as a symbol of freedom and democracy. And I wanted to ask each of our panelists if they could to give us a bit of a personal memory. Where were you 
when you got the news that the Berlin Wall was coming down? What were the circumstances? Did somebody come in and tell you? Uh, and I'd like to hear all your personal stories, starting with Secretary Baker. Well, I had been uh, Secretary of State, I think, for all of nine months uh, when, it, when it happened, Doug. I was, um, I suppose, the last Cold War Secretary of State that this country uh, ever had. Uh, and I was sitting, I was uh, at a lunch on the uh, uh, eighth floor of the State Department, a lunch that I was hosting for the President of the Philippines, Corazon Aquino when someone from the Secretariat of the State Department came in and handed me a note that said that the East German government has just announced that there's going to be free transit between uh, East and West Berlin. Uh, and it was a rather, in fact, uh, as you go out, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to take a look at the uh, exhibit that's in the front foyer out there, you'll see a copy of that note that was given to me among other things, but uh, it was a rather startling thing. I'm not sure that uh, we were, that any of us uh, were ready to predict that, even though, as these gentlemen uh, know better than I, uh, Hungary had opened uh, a portion of the, of the uh, Iron Curtain and was permitting some transit by East Germans into, uh, across Hungary or into Austria. Uh, and and so it, it was apparent that things were in, in ferment, things were going to happen. Anyway, I got this note, and we, I proposed a toast to the table at the time. We drank a toast uh, to the fact that uh, it looked like the wall was coming down. We weren't positive at that time. Uh, and then I excused myself and went down to my office on the seventh floor and called President Bush. And... Uh, and he said, I would like it if you could, if you could make your apologies uh, to President Aquino and then come on over here. So I left. I did. I went back upstairs, apologized for having to leave, went back to the, went over to the White House. And it was then and there that uh, I think we, we basically uh, agreed that, that um, this was not a time for the United States to be triumphant that there wouldn't be any dancing on the ruins of the wall. And President Bush, those of you who remember that time in, in the States, will remember that President Bush got a lot of criticism for not showing more emotion when the Berlin Wall came down. After all, isn't this something that we had been uh, rhetorically supporting for 40 years? And, of course, it was. But he knew, and he, in his wisdom and, and uh, the, the really expert way in which he handled this, he knew we had a lot of business still to do with the leaders in the Soviet Union, including, among other things, German unification. And he was simply not going to poke it in their eye and, uh, and be too uh, triumphal in, on, uh, over the fact that the wall had come down. That's where I was. I spent uh, the better part of that evening over there at the White House and and uh, then came back, and we were, and it was confirmed to us that in fact there was free transit, and that East Germans, as I said in my opening remarks, were flooding the crossing points so there to was get a, into West Berlin. There, was there ever a champagne moment in the days after the wall started to come down when you well, really? There was a champagne moment at that at that lunch, as I told you. We I, I, pro <laughs> I proposed a toast, and we drank a toast to the fact that it looked like the wall was coming down. Uh, I don't, I don't pinpoint that as the end of the Cold War. I think someone here said earlier, that was the beginning of the end of the Cold War, and that's the way I see it. Uh, and, uh, but the Cold War ended reasonably soon after that, in my opinion. Minister Dumas? To evoke this day of November, I would like to first speak about where we were in France. It was the last semester of 89, and France was presiding the European community. As you know, this changed every six months, and this was in the middle of these events that the, they were presiding and to rule over the countries of the community. And so, as was usual, the president of the community, together with the minister, which is myself, would tour the capital to talk about the events that had to happen by December in a month. So, on this day of November 11th, 
On November 9th, we had a meeting to talk about this in Copenhagen, Denmark, with the authorities from Denmark. So that is when we learned about the fall of the wall during the day on the radio, on the TV. And then in the evening, we had to talk about these issues with the Danish, and we were all in contact by telephone. We were not surprised, like I explained a minute ago, because the deterioration with the Eastern German government was clear. So this was the conclusion of an event. But the next day we were in Paris, and the next day President Mitterrand told me I need to speak to Gorbachev right away, because within the idea that we had, how is this going to happen? What is going to happen now? And the concern, of course, was that the Russian troops were in the eastern countries. What are they going to do? What are the Russian troops going to do? There were so many things that were going to happen and that could happen that we didn't know whether Gorbachev would continue with his perestroika and glasnost policy, or is he going to do the contrary with the tradition of remaining strong? It, was he going to make his troops advance or not? We didn't know that. So there was a very long conversation the next day between Gorbachev and Mitterrand. Mitterrand started saying, I was there working as an interpreter, and he said, this is extraordinary. And do you know what Gorbachev said? Right there, live, he said, this is extraordinary. It's a pity that this has not happened before. So that means Gorbachev already knew this was coming. And immediately after, we organized the meeting with Gorbachev, because I have to say that the two, and I'm sorry to say this, but you know that the two greatest powers, which was the US and Russia, and we represented Europe. So Europe wasn't really invited. So as a republic, we were a little concerned, actually. I say this diplomatically. But <laughs> so we weren't sure if he was talking on behalf of France or, or not, but Mitterrand said, I have to see Gorbachev. So we organized a famous German, uh, German, East German uh, meeting, and this is when the, on the 9th in Paris, because the question was, where were you? Well, I was in Paris, so the news came out, and we started with the consultations with Gorbachev, and so I say, I say this to show that it had already been decided that we had to go further, which reassured us, because at that time when the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia, Poland, in, Var in Varsovia. So in Warsaw, we knew that this was going to move forward. Like I said earlier, we took this proposal with the 10 points, and this was going to take time. Gorbachev was furious, and he said, but this is coming back to the Third Reich. This is not serious. This goes against the movement. And the movement is what he had already said during his conversation. That is to say, it's too bad this didn't happen earlier. He was convinced that the direction that he had chosen was the right one. And I can say today, in front of all of you here, uh, you are very informed that nothing would have been possible, things would not have happened, and we would not have happened without the energy and the presence of Gorbachev. Gorbachev was the craftsman. He was the most intelligent person that he knew what was going on. I don't know if all the other Western powers, and we will talk about this later, possibly today, but of how important the relationship with Gorbachev was and with his policy. It was very important. And on that day, on the 9th, the only one who knew that was Gorbachev. Thank you. Voila. Minister Genscher. Yeah. I mentioned before that uh, Peter Chancellor, uh, uh, I were in, in Warsaw. But what happened before? 
In summer 89, not thousands, but ten thousands of Germans spent their holidays in Hungary. And uh, then they decided to stay in Hungary, not to return to GDR. And uh, on the 10th of September 89, the reform communist system and leaders in Hungary took a courageous decision. They decided to open their border to Austria. And they were criticized very hardly by GDR. They were criticized as traitors in the communist camp. They were, by the way, not criticized by the leadership in Moscow. Then uh, the border between Czechoslovakia and Hungary was closed. So those people who wanted to leave GDR could only travel to Warsaw and to Czechoslovakia. That's the reason why more and more refugees from East Germany came into our embassy in Prague. It was in the end of September where 4,500 people in an embassy and in the garden of the embassy. Can you imagine what that means? And uh, at the same time, we had the General Assembly of the United Nations, so I had the opportunity to speak to the Foreign Minister of GDR and to speak to the Foreign Minister of the uh, Soviet Union. And uh, on the 29th of uh, September, just before leaving New York, I received the message that they will inform me next morning in Bonn about the conditions, how the people can leave, not the conditions, the way how the people in the embassy can leave for West Germany. And they made a remarkable decision. We had discussed in what way can they leave uh, Czechoslovakia. They could go directly to the First Republic because we have a common border. They had a common border with Czechoslovakia. And the second alternative was the trains will uh, pass GDR. And to my great surprise, they decided the train should pass GDR, what meant that thousands of refugees by trains of GDR pass GDR are not stopped. They had criticized 20 days before that the Hungarian leadership opened the border and now they themselves, 20, just 20 days later, decided to open. That was, I think, a clear signal that the war would not uh, exist forever. Why did they build the war? When on, in August 1961, the leadership in D DDR decided to build that war, this was the clear statement that the uh, competition between the two systems, democracy and market economy on the one side, and socialist system, as I this competition was lost by GDR. And because it was lost, thousands of people month by month left GDR. When I personally left GDR in 52, it was in August 52, in this single um, month, 30,000 people left GDR. 30,000 in one month. So they stopped this transfer, but uh, in 89, we had a situation that could not, they could not continue their policy. And at the same time, the demonstrations started. Demonstrations in, in the cities as mentioned by Markus Mecke. So it was really done by the people in the streets. And uh, I, I think uh, it would never happen in such a peaceful way without uh, the position, the clear position of the Soviet Union, and this clear position was no use of force. No use of force. If the people want it, it should happen. And that was, I think, the reason for Gorbachev that he finally agreed to German unification and finally agreed to German unification, accepting that Germany as a whole 
should be member of NATO and should be member of the European Community. It was not an easy decision for the leadership in the Soviet Union. It was a courageous decision they did, and I admire this courage these two people had, I mean Gorbachev and Shevardnadze. Thank you. Lord Paul. Well, coming back to your question of where I was and what I was doing, if you would ask me what I was doing and where I was last week, I probably wouldn't be able to tell you. But uh, 9th of November 1989 is one of those days that does stay with you, rather like where were you when the day President Kennedy was assassinated. It was an event of uh, enormous importance. And as we've been hearing, um, the American president works in the magnificence of the White House and uh, Mr. Dumas went running around to the grandeur of the Elysee Palace and uh, Hans Dietrich was in the glittering halls of the Bundeskanzleramt. A British prime minister works in a modest little townhouse, Jerry built in, 19, in 1740, which has been the office of the prime minister ever since. And I was in my cubby hole there in the uh, early evening watching television. I suddenly saw what was happening. So I went upstairs to the room where Margaret Thatcher was working and said, uh, there's something quite interesting going on. British understatement, this is. Something quite interesting going on. <laughs> you better switch on television and look at it. And then, of course, I kicked myself. She didn't have a television. <laughs> so we went back downstairs to my television. And I think Margaret Thatcher had three emotions, really, one after the other. One was surprise. I don't think any of us have predicted this was going to happen so quickly. And, of course, we do now know it was the result of complete incompetence by an East German official who just got muddled up and didn't mean to open the wall at all. Um, but there we are. Life is like that sometimes. So surprise was her first emotion. Elation was the second. This was what we had all dreamed of so long. This hated symbol, the worst symbol of the division of Europe, was going to come down. And that was just wonderful. And her third emotion straight after that was caution. This was a dangerous moment in her view. When great empires like the Soviet Empire start to crumble, then you have to be very, very careful. What was actually going to happen? Could the natural joy of the people pouring through the wall be restrained? Or would there be incidents involving Soviet forces? It could easily have happened just needed a small group of people to go and throw empty beer bottles or something at Soviet forces, someone to shoot, there would be trouble. And that sentiment was really reinforced a bit the next day when um, yeah, Margaret Thatcher spoke to Chancellor Cole and uh, he gave her an account of what was happening and it was a wonderfully dramatic and happy account and she was enormously relieved and pleased by that. But then we got a request from the Soviet ambassador to come in late that night with a message from President Gorbachev. Now, in history, on the whole, when Soviet ambassadors ask to see you late at night, it tends not to be good news. <laughs> uh, so we wondered a bit what was going to happen. And I rang General Scowcroft in the White House, my close and dear friend, and uh, he had had a similar message. And the same was true of Horst Telchik in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Bonn. Now, as it happened, it was a very sensible, restrained message from President Gorbachev, exactly as was described by Mr. Dumas just now, saying, um, we must be careful. We must avoid incidents. We must avoid provocations. This is a very, very delicate moment. And I think that caution uh, at that moment was justified. Uh, as it was, everything went smoothly. But we couldn't have known that at the time. Maybe I could just say one last thing at this time. It's easy just to focus on the fall of the wall and German reunification. But there were many other great and dangerous events going on just then. Above all, the massacre in Tiananmen Square in Beijing, which had happened only very shortly beforehand. This was an extremely fraught moment in the diplomatic history of the world. And we shouldn't, though naturally, obviously, we're focusing tonight on the fall of the wall and German reunification. Don't let's forget what was going on in the rest of the world. Thank you very much. <laughs> Minister Merkel. I mentioned before that for me and from my experience in that time in East Germany, the 9th of October was the most important date because from that date we were sure that it would be possible to establish democracy. And then in the evening of the 9th of November we had a meeting 
in Magdeburg, a city close to the western border at that time. Uh, and we organized and prepared the foundation of the regional uh, Social Democratic Party. And late in the evening, I came home and saw in TV what happened. Uh, and in difference to the majority of the whole world, I was not so happy about that. Because for me, that day, in that time, it was clear we will delete the wall, but after having democracy. And so, for me, it was the first message, it will be more complicated, because more actors will take place, will take part in the play. Um, and this was immediately aware for me. And if you see the remembrance today, you can see it, that all, there is no, not so much differentiation in the remembrance between the 9th of November and the 3rd of October. It will, is put together as one event. But that's not the case. Uh, it is difficult in the remembrance to d describe and declare the people why in East Germany, after the 9th of November, it was necessary in, to have a round table. Why a partial East German uh, election? Uh, that is not understandable if you look, uh, look back. And it is important uh, to make it aware because uh, for us it was very important that we need a negotiated unification. And this was a crucial point for us. And the framework for that unification and, the, and that uh, negotiation, this was a point. But I know that Mr. Shavatnat is waiting. Uh, and so I can uh, continue after uh, his speech uh, then. Uh, but I really think that we have to be aware about that question of how to deal with that in that time. The process of democratization and unification became one process from that day. The time before, nobody, nobody in the East and in the West had any clear strategy how to get it, that unification. Um, and this was clear that the United States, the former allies, uh, West Germany, all these were part of the of the play. And if you see the German-Polish border uh, in the ten-point program, so-called program of Mr. Cole, it was not mentioned. Um, in that time, uh, Mr. Genscher, in his speech of the United Nations, uh, he mentioned it, but it was much more difficult with Mr. Cole uh, to solve that question uh, of that border. For us, it was clear the acceptance of that border was a responsibility of the following of the Second World War uh, and our responsibility. Uh, if you see the speeches of Mr. Cole, he was using the phrasing that it is a compensation for the German unity. And this is quite another perspective. And this was a difficulty for the following months. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I think we are being joined by uh, former Foreign Minister of the Soviet Union, Edward Shevardnadze, from uh, Tbilisi, Georgia. Edward, uh, greetings. This is your friend Jim Baker. How are you? Uh, we're, I'm here with all of your former colleagues, and our moderator is the distinguished American historian Douglas Brinkley. First of all, I would like to greet you, my dear colleagues. Thank you so much. 
Mr. Baker, who initiated uh, this meeting, is according to his initiative. I am greeting to you, all of you, to my friends, to my colleagues, to our friends. We know in such way each other. I, I would like to apologize that I'm not with you right now. The thing is that in, in my, at my age, <laughs> sometimes I cannot hear even to doctors. The doctor said that you cannot have flight in such a distance, it's dangerous. And so I have to obey to them. Now, briefly, in two words, I would like to note that that we did together, that we able to do together, we were able to do that. What we practically did, and which, uh, the world has been changed. This is the result of we think in the same way. We were we were combining together, and we are together at the same way. By the way, what we we were able to do together for what we tried in detail to do it in details. I, I, I tried to explain in my last book, Memoirs, uh, and I, I claimed the gay share. The, and I noted that the falling of Berlin Wall is very serious. I will try to answer all the questions. I will try to take part in all the discussions that will take place. And I think that this meeting uh, will have good results. Uh, we fought together, we know each other, we uh, fought for the same cause. And uh, we uh, were able to change the world. The world is not the same. It's not what it used to be. Your, Your Excellency, I wanted to ask you, it would appear that the biggest threat to peaceful unification of Germany would have been a decision by the Kremlin to call on Soviet troops to prevent it from happening. Was there ever any realistic possibility of that happening? Yes, was there I can ever hear a, you. We were discussing, I mean, is there ever the possibility of the Kremlin calling on Soviet troops to do something to prevent either um, the peaceful unification of Germany or the uh, tearing down of the Berlin Wall? Uh, the thing is that before Germany's unification started, uh, the Soviet troops were already in Berlin and around Berlin. Uh, it was half a million uh, people. Uh, the army consisted of half a million people, and Stalin ordered those troops to go there. And uh, uh, it wasn't necessary to have so many troops there. Uh, but the explanation for that is that the uh, United States, which was one of the oppo opposition, uh, the main opposition, they had the uh, uh, nuclear nuclear weapons. They had the, nucle the Soviet Union had the nuclear weapon weapons, and uh, if the uh, forces were in Central Europe near Berlin, and if the United States uh, used the nuclear weapons, uh, then these troops would be ordered 
to fight and just bomb the whole Europe until the Atlantic Ocean. And um, these were allies of the United States. Um, these, these countries then, and back then when we were talking about Germany's unification, uh, uh, for that time frame to put the troops there, it didn't make any sense at that time. We've been talking about where people were when the Berlin Wall started to come down. Where were you at at that moment? What's your personal recollection of that um, historic moment? Yes, I remember very uh, clearly it was uh, on the 8th and um, I would like to uh, clarify that the fall of the Berlin Wall should not be discussed as the event that happened all at once. This was a process that t took a while to happen and um, Sometimes there were demonstrations, um, and there were some uh, representatives in Berlin that used to go, and uh, and they they were uh, there was a uh, they were trying to abolish these demonstrations to stop these demonstrations, and on the ninth. We got the information from the embassy that it was possible for Germany uh, for German, to be big changes in Germany and for the, uh, it might be important for Soviet troops to get involved in this. And there were some agreements that the troops should not be involved, no matter, uh, and, and also there were some meetings against that, about that, and we made a decision to fly on the 9th. We arrived in Berlin. You might ask me why two people had to go in the region at that time, but if it was decided for the troops to get involved in this, then the um, uh, uh, foreign minister might not have listened to this, so it was very important for the uh, general to go there and we stop the troops from involvement. It was a big event, which was practically afterwards uh, helped for uh, Germany's unifi unification process. And it didn't happen in one or two days. This was a process that took a while uh, to happen. Thank you. Um, Secretary uh, Baker. Uh, Edward, I want to say one more time, this is Jim Baker, <clears throat> how very appreciative we are that you have joined us, particularly given the fact that it is 4.30 in the morning in Tbilisi, Georgia. And I, and I, I also want to say that every speaker here this evening, before you came on, has made the point that you and Mikhail Gorbachev deserve enormous credit because you were not willing to use force to keep the empire together. You deserve enormous, enormous credit for a peaceful end of the Cold War. Every speaker. I would like to mention that for Germany's reunification process, uh, that Gorbachev played a big role in this. If it wasn't for him, um, uh, 
without him uh, such uh, it wouldn't have happened and if we have time I would like to remind you that our meeting uh, probably uh, Mr. Baker probably remembers that in Ottawa in the capital of Canada we had a meeting and when we were talking about uh, these issues and uh, when we finished talking about uh, talking, Mr. Baker uh, uh, turned to me and said that, Edward, what do you think? We were friends. Uh, we were very, uh, we were just addressing each other with names. We were very informal. And do you think, is it time to think about Germany's unification? Uh, and despite the uh, issue that I fight, been fighting about this for a long time, uh, but nobody, I haven't had any formal meetings about this issue, and probably we should try to make everything clear that pertains to this issue. But Mr. Geisher, I wanted to hear about Mr. Geisher's opinion. Baker was telling me that Geisher was uh, okay with it. Baker would be okay with such a decision. It was important for us to talk, and we had talks and to think of the mechanism that would work on the problems of Germany's unification. This was a very historic decision, and um, James Baker was telling me that, uh, what about Garbacho? What is he going to do? Uh, what is his opinion on this issue? And uh, if, uh, it might be very strange because but me and Garbacho, despite uh, the fact that we were friends, we talked together a lot, we had a lot of meetings, we never discussed this issue before. And he was asked very often how possible it was the, the thought of Germany's unification. He never said yes, and he never said no about that, and he never answered that question. Uh, after talking to James Baker, I went to the uh, office, I called Garbachev, and I told him what was going on. That Baker had talked to me about this issue, that we should talk about Germany's unification issue, that we should think of the mechanisms, what kind of mechanisms we could use in order to um, develop this uh, process. And then two plus four mechanism, we thought about, you remember this uh, very well, Jim, uh, two plus four, two German states, uh, Soviet Union, United States, French, uh, France and Great Britain. This is two plus four. And uh, with this mechanism, we had to start working. And Garbachev was told about this uh, by me, and despite the fact that he had never said anything about this issue, he uh, thought about it for a while, one and a half, two minutes he thought about it, and then he told me that this issue sooner or later should have been decided, and it would be very good that this issue was mentioned not uh, from the heads of the states, but from the uh, Secretary of State uh, talk, started talking about this issue. So he said he was agreed on it. He wanted to start working on this issue and start on working on unification of Germ Germany. So this was uh, Gorbachev's relationship towards that uh, issue his position towards this issue. So the initiator for this decision is Jim Baker, uh, who, who I'm very happy to see. Uh, he looks very young. He looks very well. He looks the same as he looked before when I was talking to him. When now I that him. wasn't planned, Edward. <laughs> Well, let me bring in um, um, Minister Genscher. Would you like to com <laughs> Would you like to jump in? To okay. 
What what did he say? What was his last remark? Well, uh, Probably the last his last remark. Yes. Well, he he was asking you if you want to what what was your fears from the Soviet Union when you were going through this? Were you worried about what Gorbachev would do at this particular moment in time? Did you have fear of some kind of reappraisal coming from the Soviet Union while while this whole process was going down? You you mean the process the two plus four process? Yes. No. <clears throat> I think the agreement that we should discuss this question in the framework of 2 plus 4 shows that Soviet Union leadership was ready to discuss in substance, not only talk by talk, in substance. So we had to find out what is the main problem that was foreseeable. Main problem was is the state, what is the status of United Germany? Will be the United Germany a uh, neutralized country, and uh, Eduard Shevardnadze said, we have many options. When I we had a meeting, we have option Germany neutralized, Germany in two uh, defense system, Warsaw Pact and NATO, or only in NATO, only in Warsaw Pact. And uh, I answered, look into the Carta of Helsinki, where I said that every people has a right to join a defense uh, treaty or defense organization. And uh, to be serious, when we have the freedom to do that, we will join NATO. And we discussed this, and this was, I think, for uh, Eduard Shevard Nazi and uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, the most important and most complicated question after they had agreed to German unification. This took place already, I think, four or five year, year, days before when Helmut Kohl and I were in the Soviet Union. And Gorbachev said, German unification is up to the Germans to be decided. We then said we need a democratic electric leadership in uh, GDR that took place in March when we had the first free elections in this part of Germany after the Second World War. And uh, then they had the government, free elected government. Markus Meckel was the first foreign minister of the state. But the question, what will be the external aspects? What will be the place of United Germany? This was... Uh, the main question, in addition to that, the question of uh, recognizing the German-Polish uh, border along the existing line, which uh, already was a fact since the end of the war. So uh, I was not concerned that uh, the leadership would in any way intervene in the military sense. We had discussed, uh, Eduard Shevardnadze so will remember, these questions already in uh, September 1988 uh, on the occasion of our meeting uh, in New York when, when we had the United Nations meeting there. And I said, look, we, we have to envisage demonstrations in the east of Germany next year, why not there, when uh, all over Europe, and never should be repeated from your side what the le leadership of Soviet Union did in '53. And so I think all these questions we are on the table, but my conviction was that Gorbachev and Shevardnadze not would give the order to use force. That for them it was more important that United Germany has a status which could not be a threat to the Soviet Union. What this meant, this was not clear at that time, that we had to find out in uh, the talks, in our negotiations, and bilateral talks, I remember very important was the, the visit of Gorbachev in May, I think, in, in, uh, in Washington, when he uh, had the meeting with, with President uh, Bush, where he said, let the Germans decide what, what, what will happen. Secretary Baker, uh, just to pick up on this, what were the origins of the 2 plus 4 concept? How did that begin? Well, I think it probably began somewhere around late January or early February of 1990 when we began to <clears throat> face up to 
uh, what sort of a forum we were going to utilize to deal with the external aspects of German unification. Uh, there were some who uh, who thought that uh, German unification's external aspects should be negotiated by the four occupying powers, uh, the the uh, Western, well, the Soviet Union, the United States, France, and and Great Britain, who had won the Second World War. Others thought that that uh, those external aspects should be negotiated in the con in the context of uh, the 30 35 nation member. Uh, conference on security and cooperation in Europe, which would have been, of course, a very unwieldy way uh, to go about it. Uh, there were some who favored the idea that maybe just the two Germanys would negotiate both the internal and ex external aspects. That was not uh, practical, obviously, since there were treaty obligations uh, arising out of the uh, second, the end of the Second World War. And uh, yeah. May I remember, for the first time, we discussed the framework when I came in November 89. Was, who should negotiate? The, my my recollection yeah, was yeah, that was Jan yeah, I said yeah, January yeah. 90. Was it November was, 89? It, yeah. I remember uh, discuss, discussing it uh, with Hans Dietrich. I thought it was January 89, maybe, uh, uh, maybe I mean, January 90, maybe it was uh, November 89. But we talked a little bit about it. My first recollection of the concept of 2 plus 4 was when uh, s some uh, fellows that worked in the policy planning staff of the State Department brought me a paper that said, this is the four type of uh, arrangement we ought to use to negotiate the external aspects of German unification. And we called it 4 plus 2. And I met uh, then shortly thereafter, whether it was in the end of uh, 89 or the beginning of uh, 90. And with this Hans part Dietrich. of the discussion was really in the beginning of, of it, 90. It was, well, you and I talked. We were sitting, we were sitting in front of the fireplace in, in my uh, office at the State Department, and I said four plus two, and you said no, no, two plus four. <laughs> and and uh, start again. <laughs> And that was because you said, well, after all, the two Germanys are the two important. Uh, they're the ones that are unifying. And I said, well, you know, we don't have any real problem with that. Uh, I'll talk to our French friends and our British friends yeah. and, see why, and see how we come out. And we came out okay. And they said, yeah, that's good. And then we went to the Open Skies Conference in Ottawa, which uh, Edward Chevernazzi has just uh, recounted to you, where we all talked about whether we should use 2 plus 4, and everybody agreed that 2 plus 4 was a proper mechanism because it had everybody at the table who had any interest in the external aspects. But you will remember that on the margins of that Open Skies Conference in Ottawa, there was a NATO ministerial meeting where you and I particularly got a lot of heat and a lot of grief from our from the other member nations of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, other than the United Kingdom and France, for not including them. You will remember that very vividly. Uh, and I remember Hans teaching not, not to be too undiplomatic here. I remember you looking at one of the particular uh, people who was objecting the most and looked at him and you said, "You're not a player in this." And, 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 and that was the end of that, and we did. And so that's how we got to 2 plus 4. And it was actually a very good forum, very good mechanism, because that way everybody was at the table, and nobody could go off and cut any side deals. And I must say that as far as the United States is concerned, one of our paramount interests, of course, was that the unified Germany be a member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. We didn't want a neutral Germany in the heart of Europe, but we didn't also want you going off and cutting a deal with the Soviet Union, to which we were not a party. So it was an ideal arrangement, right? Very good. Yes. Look, Lord, let's, I, let's bring I, Lord. I, 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 should, uh, I think we should, Eduard Shevardnadze, tell one story. When we were sitting together in the east of Berlin, the second meeting, he addressed in a very hard language. It was just before the party convention. I understood this for domestic reasons. It was necessary. And you give me a settlement. 
uh, you give me a piece of paper and with a question, what does that mean? And I answered, window dressing. <laughs> window dressing. <laughs> window dressing, yes. For right. domestic reasons. Yeah, Lord, that's right. Lord Pohl. Let's bring Lord Pohl into the conversation. What was Margaret Thatcher's, did she seem to have quite a, a bit of worries about German reunification? What was her concerns? Well, Margaret Thatcher certainly did have worries about German reunification. And being Margaret Thatcher, she didn't keep quiet about them. She expressed them rather loudly and repeatedly and sharply. And really, I think it stemmed from three reasons. One, for people of her generation who grew up in the 1930s and had memories in their most impressionable years of the rise of Nazism and then of the horrors of the Second World War, there was always a lingering worry that Germany could somehow revert to similar behavior. Now, rationally, of course, she knew that Germany was completely different after the Second World War, but nonetheless, that, that worry was in the back of her mind. And Margaret Thatcher admired Germany very much. One of the people she admired most in post-war politics was actually Ludwig Erhard. And she had, on the whole, quite a good relationship with Chancellor Kohl, but not really as good as it should have been. And that was very much more, I have to say, and she would admit it, her fault than his. Chancellor Kohl tried very hard to get on with Margaret Thatcher, so hard that he invited her to spend a weekend down in his home in the uh, central south of Germany. And I went along with her, and very hospitably, he took her around and showed her everything and uh, took her to his favorite pub, and we ate his favorite dish, which was pig stomach. And you, <laughs> and you can imagine how, how well that went down. And um, at the end of the visit, he took us to the great Romanesque cathedral in Speyer, where in the crypt you find the tombs of the early Holy Roman emperors. And while Margaret Thatcher was admiring these prophets of European unification, Chancellor Cole took me behind a pillar and said, listen, now she's seen me here in my home territory, right at the heart of Europe, close to France. Surely she will finally realize that I'm not so much German, I'm European, and you've got to convince her. And I said, well, Chancellor, I'll do my best. And um, we then went off back to the airport to climb aboard the little plane we had flown over from London in. And as she went up the steps, she threw herself into her seat, she kicked off her shoes and said, Charles, that man is so German. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say, at that point, I aborted my mission. I thought, uh, <laughs> but coming back to being a little more serious about it, I think the other, the other reservation, she, the, the other worry she had about reunification was not the fact of reunification, she couldn't possibly be against that. She, like everyone else, had signed endless declarations supporting it. But she was worried about a rush to reunification. And one of her worries that it would destabilize the position of Mr. Gorbachev and Mr. Shevardnadze, both of whom she admired hugely for what they were doing in the Soviet Union and for the attitude they had taken to the growing evidence of uh, freedom in, in Eastern Europe. And she was worried there could well be some sort of backlash from hardliners in the Soviet Politburo, which might destabilize them. And that would be sad in itself, but it would, be, it would be terrible for the rest of Eastern Europe. And we must always remember that German reunification was only one part of this process. There were other countries and their interests involved in Hungary and Czechoslovakia and Poland and the Baltic states. People there, too, were hoping for democracy, hoping for the right to decide what sort of government they should have. And all their interests had to be taken into account. And those, those worries did make Mrs. Thatcher very difficult. Now, to be honest, she was not unique in Europe in having these worries. She held detailed discussions of them with President Mitterrand of France. She talked to many other European leaders. And she, I think I would say that those worries were certainly shared by others. Uh, they were certainly far less outspoken about them. But it was not difficult to be less outspoken than Margaret Thatcher. But um, it, was a, it was a concern. What, of course, none of us knew at the time was how fast events were going to move. Um, 
And really, her idea, which was, I think, one already articulated by Markus Merkel, that she thought the right thing to do was to have free elections in East Germany and have a democratically elected government, and then move to a confederation between East and West Germany and leading on to reunification, a process spread over a number of years, which she regarded as the least likely to upset the stability of Europe and the security institutions which we had there. So those were her concerns. Um, obviously, as history turned out, she was wrong. I mean, German reunification was carried out very skillfully by Chancellor Kohl, by Hans-Dietrich Genscher, uh, and, and by the other gentlemen here. But at the time, those were not stupid things to be worried about. They were actually quite sensible things to be worried about. And as always, I think she had the courage to speak up and make those points, even though they were not exactly popular. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think... Uh, yeah. Min- yeah. Well, let me go yeah. first. Yeah. Min- Minister Dumas, uh, what about France in this situation, in the sense that Germany had started World War I and World War II. Why was France ready for uh, German reunification? Je voudrais d'abord euh, saluer mon ami euh, et lui dire que Firstly, je suis heureux like to... de le voir euh, en bonne santé. <laughs> Say to Mr. Shevardnadze that I'm very glad to see him looking great. He doesn't look tired at all, and age doesn't wither him. I'm very happy to see you. So I want to come back to this discussion, which is very interesting. Obviously, several points of view regarding this last issue, which Mr. Shevardnadze brought up, which is the conclusion of this whole period. That is to say, after six meetings, we have had six meetings, don't forget, the last one had, was held in Moscow with uh, Mr. Gorbachev, and we did sign a treaty. Now, we can say today, did we do a good job? Yes, I can say this in front of all of these people here today, that things were re-established in Europe, the community became the European Union with the addition of East Germany. Germany as a whole is a part of of NATO, which Mr. Baker was constantly mentioning that we should not forget about this. So this is the peace treaty, well, the peace treaty, the Moscow treaty, I should say, which after many discussions was signed and the Allies were very severe among each other and we had a lot of arguments and with this 2 plus 4, 4 plus 2 that uh, my friend next to me was mentioning I told him at one point well 4 plus 2 makes what in Germany and he says well 6 and I said 2 plus 4 is how much in German is 6 well then it's all the same and he wasn't too convinced though I must say I asked him that question 2 plus 4, 4 plus 2 it's all the same but obviously there is the diplomacy the tacit meaning what is not said but coming back to what Mr. Shevardnadze said he must remember clearly the negotiations of course since you participated that 2 plus 4 and you participated very happily and we did achieve this treaty I repeat in Moscow with Gorbachev being present who actually he was the head of the meeting what was the key concerns for you and Gorbachev during this possibility of the 2 plus 4, 4 plus 2, as far as the sequels from the war, the war, or with the Warsaw Pact that which later was dissolved. The the German troops, the Russian troops, the American troops were all retiring. So what was your concern? Because I remember we don't always agree here. So today I would like to take advantage of the fact that you're here with us. And if you do remember, I do have the memory that you had two concerns. I would say more moral than legal, more moral than political. The first was the attitude that 
the countries that again were acquiring independence that were under the Soviet rule and were wanting independence, what would be their attitude with respect to the monuments of the Soviet army during the war? I do remember that it was a secondary issue, but however, during the historical context and today's context as well, which we might be talking about in a few minutes, it had a sentimental value. And I do remember that Shevardnadze had said at least there should be an engagement between these parties to negotiate, to talk about or to have these monuments be cleaned and respected. And I think this was more of a moral issue rather than a legal or political issue. But secondly, the other concern was how do we deal with these agreements because, for example, the troops with the NATO pact that they should not violate the ancient Soviet Union borders. And so, clearly, today there's a discussion that arises around this subject. But this is unimportant because what does matter is that the spirit within these conversations happened, the spirit that was present. The pacts were disengaged. We come to this peaceful era, and it is important, and as he said, and he's not wrong to say that this is, was done in a, in a certain way that was important. So constantly there are discussions about this. We keep talking about this. There were decisions that were made to install, to implement, and we talk about this current, pol current policy. Maybe you're going to ask about this today, but we, for example, have with, talk about the prior U.S. president, not the current, the, the, to go ahead and put in the anti- nuclear missiles in Poland. Maybe Shevardnadze can confirm this, but in the position that I was in, this was against not so much the law or the policies, but the spirit of agreement that we had after this last Moscow conference. So what I understood was that this was not commented very much by the reporters, and I'm sorry if there's some of you in the audience Inside. This is a friendly reminder, but that we stopped these measures and we will take other measures. So Russia had reacted to this and the reaction was to stop the negotiations regarding the weapons. So the question is, do you remember these discussions that we had on the 2 plus 4, 4 plus 2, 2 plus 4, it's always 6 anyway. So, or does this President remind you Shemanasi, of anything? that's to you. <laughs> uh, thank you. I would like I would like to say in one word uh, to uh, to deal with two questions. First of all, I always was interested in what was going going on around the uh, the, the Berlin Wall. Not only when it was was officially declared as a fallen, destroyed. Uh, what was going on before that? And my promise. Uh, was in the, uh, such a uh, uh, promise was that in spite of uh, existence of the world, the West, West uh, German representatives and Eastern German uh, citizens, uh, they had a relationship with each other. There were messages, there were letters. There were transfer of money. Of course, the from West it was more, but Eastern German, respectively, there were also uh, the messages and uh, parcels and sendings. And I concluded to that these people live with their own life, and our mission is don't annoy them and let them unify and live their life. First of all, the second. 
Has Dietrich. They should uh, oh, add Hans Dietrich that when there was defined the question German, issue, the Germans should be unified. There was demand from Germans. The Germans should be remained as a member of NATO. We and me and Gorbachev and Soviet Union were against that. It was like deadlock. Then. The second issue was how amount weapon and troops must should uh, German unified German should have ought to have, and they should uh, find compromise. We agreed that Germany would stay, uh, would be member of NATO, but it mixed uh, the power will be limited, would be limited, would be limited according to agreement. I don't remember it was 300,000 or the German, in fact, it's huge. Uh, the statehood could have half a million troops, but Germany uh, was powerful because the amount of troop he limited and he found compromise. So Germany would be member of NATO. The German took responsibility, limited uh, their, their military force. It was very important. And one more issue I would like to draw attention. German unification problem, it was not between two or three uh, states. It was not solved between all these countries. There was presidents, presidents were involved, for example, me, Roland Reagan, I met seven times, and three times or four times, we discussed it with two, three, two times the unification of Germany. Ronald Reagan's expressions, you remember, Soviet Empire is, uh, Soviet Union is Empire of Abel. Uh, there was some truth in this, but Empire of Abel was the first meeting was very hard. The second meeting was a bit milder, and other meetings were. Uh, Baker was attending other meetings, and eventually, uh, we and third uh, the meeting, uh, Reagan had lunch, and we were talking in ordinary people, like ordinary people, as not like opposition people. I would like. To, I would like to remind. Uh, it was, uh, do you remember the Malti meeting Shavadar in Malta, Malta at Malta, Malta? Uh, Malta, uh, Shevardnadze, Gorbachev, uh, Father Bush, and Schulz were attending. At Malta meeting, we agreed that since then, we are not enemies since then. Then Baker. Jim uh, 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 invited me in Wyoming and he said to me that I would like to show you uh, my, first vi uh, my new villa I built up. I, I had a flight for four hours. We had second time of um, the meeting and we composed the document, declaration. Declaration? Uh, there was written declaration. We are not not only enemies or opposition, but since then we are partners. Of this, it's not only my contribution. If not Reagan's goodwill, if not goodwill of Gorbachev's goodwill. Also, and the French minister, teachers, and others, and others, then the German, German unification would not happen, or it would deal with World War, and we would deal, we would go to World War. I want to assure, if we would, would not go Gorbachev with Gorbachev in Paris and Berlin, the Soviet troops would be involved. And you, what does the troops in, be involved? Let means to start a new war. So was a situation. Maybe you remember many of you. Thank you so much. I want to, a Minister Meckel has been anxiously trying to get into the discussion. So we're going to have you make your comment, and then I have a question for Secretary Baker. We're going to open it up to some questions from the audience. 
I met Mr. Shabatnaz the first time in the end of April, in our first visit as a new government uh, to Moscow. And I had three messages uh, for him. Uh, the first is, we are not yet, as a new democratic elected government, we are not yet the young brother who has to obey Moscow. That's the first point. The second point is, um, the German unification will come and will happen, although if Moscow would like to prevent it, if they would prevent it, because the people in East Germany want, really do want the unification. And the third was, we are interested in respecting the interests of Soviet Union in that process and for the future of Europe, because uh, it has to be prevented at Versailles for the Soviet Union for that time, because that would destabilize Europe for the future. This seemed to us as three important messages. And if I see what happened in that time, um, I think we were not so much fixed to the NATO question. My conviction was that after the, separ uh, after the end of the division of Europe, uh, the whole Europe has to be changed, not only the East. It can't be that the West will only continue. And so my, uh, I insisted in a change of NATO, in the change of strategy, you will remember, and it was not so easy uh, to talk about change of strategy, strange of weapons, uh, and uh, much more had to be changed, and that was not so easy to do so. I hoped in the beginning that German unification can be the first step and the instrument in the same time to change the security system in Europe at all. Um, it was clear. Uh, I was in the beginning not a professional uh, politician. I started my career to be a foreign, foreign minister. Um, other uh, uh, finish their uh, political career to be a foreign minister. But uh, I was very much convicted that that change of security system for Europe at all will be important. In March 90, I visited Washington first time. And from that visit, it was my experience that NATO is important because of that integration situation, to have an integrated security. This was, in my view, the most important advantage of uh, NATO. But its concrete strategy, I doubt, doubted in that time. And so uh, the second point was the question of um, disarmament. Uh, Mr. Shavadnaz mentioned it, the question of the troops um, of Germany, both together in addition, and the others, on the other hand, the question of nuclear weapons. I raised that question, uh, as you remember, and no of you was happy about that. Um, and I think until now that this is really a question. It couldn't be solved in that time. But if you see the situation today, um, that question has to be solved in the future uh, with all of us. And uh, we have really to do much uh, to solve that question that question which couldn't be solved in that time. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Secretary Baker, I wanted to ask you one last question, and we have people in the audience have put questions in, and we're going to ask a few. But I have the last question for Secretary Baker. I've read a number of places that you've called the coming down of the Berlin Wall the symbolic end of the Cold War. If that's the symbolic end, what marked the full end of the Cold War in your mind? Well, I think <clears throat> the coming, the, the uh, downfall of the wall is the, was a symbolic end, but it was more than that. It was the, be as, as Hans Dietrich said, it was the beginning of the end of the Cold War. Uh, the substantive end of the Cold War, for me at least, and Edward Shevardnadze will remember this, 
was when he and I stood shoulder to shoulder together in a uh, an airport in Moscow, and we condemned the actions of a Soviet client state in its unprovoked aggression against a small neighbor when Iraq invaded Kuwait in August of 1990. Uh, that, to me, really signaled the end of the Cold War, when you could have an American Secretary of State and a foreign minister of the Soviet Union standing shoulder to shoulder and calling for an arms embargo against a Soviet a client state. Now, before you go to the questions from the audience, Doug, if I might, I, wanted, I, w I want the audience to know that we had a lot of difficult issues, uh, but we also were operating in a real spirit of friendship across the board. You've heard a lot here tonight about the reservations that some of the United States' longtime allies in Western Europe uh, had with respect to German unification. The United Kingdom, France, and I never will forget when we signed the treaty, the 2 plus 4 treaty on German unification in Moscow on the 12th of September, I thought I might have a little fun with our friend Hans Dietrich Genscher. And I turned to him after it was all over, we were drinking a champagne toast, and I said, now Hans Dietrich, when will we now, when will we take up the question of the German-Chinese border? <laughs> and he looked at me rather quizzically and he said, the German-Chinese border? <laughs> Do you remember that? Anyway, let's go to the okay. question from the well, great. Um, mm -hmm. Minister Meckel, people, somebody here was wondering if you could replay history and looking back in um, 1989 and 1990, if there's anything you would have changed about what you did. And there's also an interest of whether you were, um, there was a Christian movement involved in East Germany, you as a pastor. <clears throat> looking back, surely I would have done some things in another way. Uh, for instance, what I mentioned before, it, it was clear that what I had in mind in the beginning to change many European issues connected with the German unification, that was impossible. Uh, I see it looking backwards very clear. And so I personally had a wrong strategy uh, for that field. Uh, and I, in the end, have to say that the 2 plus 4 talk, uh, not the talks, the treaty, is in my view the best of the treaties concerning German unification. But I think also that the challenges which I meant and I dealt with are continuing one. Uh, as I mentioned, for instance, uh, with the question of nuclear weapons and the question of integration uh, to get an integrated security which is important for Europe at all. Um, looking back, the question of Christian uh, movement, it's a long story. Uh, I would say I created a social democratic party f by theologian reasons, thinking that using the Christian belief for political issues is, in my view, every time a problem. It has to be argued in a rational way. Everybody has to understand it, and everybody, which is his belief ever, has to be get to understand it. Uh, and that's why there is a relationship but on the other hand, it has to be differentiated. Great, thank you. Uh, President Shevardnadze, we have a question for you from the audience, and they are wondering whether there was ever a risk um, that Russian leadership would be overthrown in a coup d'etat of some sort, and if so, did the Russian leadership uh, have a, a, a plan of action if there was a attempt to topple your government over uh, apparent weakness over uh, the Germany um, and the Berlin Wall coming down? 
I didn't hear, I, I, I could not hear before that. There's a question to you from the audience, and they would like to know if you ever felt um, in the Soviet Union that you were going to have a coup d'etat or being toppled because of taking a, a more passive approach to the Berlin Wall coming down and German reunification. Was there a fear of that? Excuse me for a minute, we're not yeah. hearing the translation. Hello? Yes. Is Excuse me. I, I, I would like, okay. I would like to say we'll try that to get the technical. Can you hear us? Yes, yes, yes. Hello. So I, I would like to say, I would like to mention this issue before that falling of the German fall and German unification was not one time process. It was a, like a component of entire process of uh, ending of Cold War. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for that remark. We're going to have to close for the evening because we've run over by about 20 minutes, I think we could have gone on for another hour or two. And I want to thank all of our panelists, not just for coming here and being part of this, but for your role in history. You're all great men, and we really appreciate you sharing the observations. Thank you all.